And we are live. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we will be talking about the yield curve and how it's starting to invert. And whenever you get a yield curve inversion, it has a high probability that a recession will follow. What a yield curve inversion simply is, is that when you look at the treasury, the treasuries and the rate that basically they're yielding, whenever the two year starts to yield more than the 10 year, that is known as an inversion. Normally, the way that the yield curve is supposed to look is it's supposed to be upward sloping with the shorter term treasuries yielding a lower rate. And then the further out you go in regards to the maturity, so two years, 10 years, 30 year treasuries, that you should get more yield for locking your money up for a longer period of time. Now, what's ironic and funny about this is that everyone now is, you have some people on one side saying that a recession is imminent over the next six to 18 months. And then you have the regulators and the politicians and you know, the Fed governors coming on and saying like, oh, you don't have to worry about the yield curve. Everything's going to be fine. And what I find funny about this is that if you've been following me on this channel, I have been telling you that a major crash is coming towards the end of this year going into 2023. And it's simply just understanding monetary policy, understanding fiscal policy, and understanding that history doesn't repeat itself but it damn sure rhymes. And this is why I encourage you guys to read books like The Creature from Jekyll Island because it allows you to have an understanding as to what is the boom and bust cycle, what is fractional reserve lending and banking, and what's problematic with both our monetary policy and our fiscal policy. What happens is that because we don't produce anything in this country, what the Fed has to do is the Fed has to engineer bubbles to create this wealth effect. So this is why you start to see asset prices rise because what the Fed is effectively doing is they're cutting interest rates. And what, when they cut interest rates and they inject liquidity and they bail out banks, stocks go up, real estate prices go up, which then allows everyone to feel much more wealthy. But what happens is that because debt is money, basically you have to go into debt in order to create the boom. You get, let's say, $5 trillion worth of debt in the system. So it looks like the economy is growing, but in reality, what's really growing is just household debt, government debt. And then something happens. We don't know what that something could be, right? It could be a recession because the economy is overheating. It could be a pandemic. It could be a war. It could be a variety of different things, but something pops the bubble. So because you have so much debt in the system, and this is also what creates artificial demand for the dollar, because remember that most of your debts are denominated in U.S. dollars. So your mortgage is denominated in dollars. Your auto loan is denominated in dollars. So what does it do? It forces you to go on the hamster wheel to earn more dollars. Also, because the dollar is the reserve currency of the world, that most other economies and countries, what do they have to do? If they want to purchase commodities, let's say oil, you, they have to convert their local currency into U.S. dollars. So this is what gives the dollar artificial demand, both debt and the petrodollar system, which we covered in our previous video. So now what begins to happen is that because it took debt to grow the economy, and then now we start to experience deflation because as the economy starts to contract, people can't pay back their debt. They start to foreclose on a home. Then it, it creates this domino effect throughout the economy. If stocks go down, real estate prices go down, people have less wealth, less money to spend. And because 70% of our economy is based upon consumption, everything starts to contract. So what does the Fed have to do? They have to reinflate the bubble. But because it took $5 trillion worth of debt to grow the bubble in the first place, now you have to issue the $5 trillion to get the bubble back up to where it currently uh, previously was. But then you have to issue even more debt to grow the economy past where it currently was. And what happens is that because we start getting these boom and bust cycles, the cycles start to get faster and faster and faster. And what the Fed has to do is they have to keep cutting interest rates. So what you're starting to see, and I'm going to show you guys this over time, the actual Fed funds rate, it's actually trending down to the point where now we're at literally one quarter of 1%, 25 basis points. And the minute that they raised rates, 
what happened? The yield curve started to invert. And I've been telling you guys, there's absolutely no way that the Fed can raise interest rates for a prolonged period of time without crashing the economy. Number one, our government doesn't take in enough tax receipts where we're basically we're spending seven and a half or seven point two trillion dollars on an annual basis. But we're only bringing in three point six trillion dollars, which is why we have to issue treasuries in the first place. Well, if the government cannot bring in enough revenue and if the Fed starts raising rates, that's going to mean that the borrowing cost for the government is going to go up. If the Fed raises rates and they keep rates high and the stock market crashes and the real estate market crashes and we go into recession, the government doesn't bring in enough tax receipts which is causing them to borrow more money in the first place. So all of these things are starting to converge and happen at the same time. I do not claim to be, you know, uh, some great seer of the future. I'm just a steadier. I just study history. And because I study history, monetary policy, I understand that the Fed is in a tight spot. But then this all ties into the greater thing that's happening, the greater problem, which is the Great Reset. Notice that all of these things are converging and happening at the same time, whether it's transhumanism, whether it's climate change, whether it's debt, whether it's politics, right? Whether it's disease, whether it's the way that we eat our food, whether it's going into the metaverse, right? Whether it's central bank digital currencies, all of these things are converging at the same time. And as governments become more and more unstable, as fiat currencies become more and more unstable, people are going to start looking for alternatives. And this is where crypto comes into play. Now, some people believe that crypto is part of the reset, meaning that it's an agenda. I tend to disagree. But this is why, you know, investing in silver is going to be important. Investing in crypto is going to be important. And also investing in gold is going to be important. Why? Because these are assets that are outside of the financial system. These are assets that cannot be financially engineered. And these are assets that you can actually take custody of. So when this reset happens, whatever we re re reset to, you're going to have assets that will allow you to reset safely. Again, if you've been following me, you would know that I've been covering this stuff now for well over two years. And a part of me is excited because I'm making so much money. But then there's another side of me that's afraid of what's going to happen to most people because most people don't even understand what's to come. They don't understand the problem. And many of them don't really have any solutions. And our politicians definitely don't have solutions. So uh, as we begin to dive into tonight's presentation, please do me a favor. Like this video, share this video, subscribe, make sure that you hit the notification bell and you set it to all. Also. YouTube does not send out my notifications sometimes. So I created a text message list where I will text you straight to your phone when I'm getting ready to go live. All you have to do is text the word YouTube to the number below. Also, I'm doing a giveaway. I am giving away $5,000 worth of cryptocurrency. Yes, you heard me correctly. I am giving away $5,000 worth of crypto. In order for you to learn about the giveaway and when I will be doing it in the details on how you can participate, you need to text the word YouTube to the number below. Also, you can follow me on Instagram. That is another platform that I share and create content on. And for those of you who are interested in learning about crypto, I am the founder and creator of My Tech Academy. We cover all things crypto, how to buy, how to sell, how to store your cryptocurrency safely, how to build a portfolio that's well balanced. We cover NFTs, how to create them, how to buy them, how to sell them. And we also cover decentralized finance known as DeFi, where we teach you how to stake your coins, how you can earn passive income and yield on those coins, liquidity mining, and so much more. Now, on April 11th, I'm going to be doing a special presentation for lifetime members where I will be teaching you how you can convert your crypto into other assets without having to go through centralized exchanges like Coinbase. This is going to be very, very important as we start talking about you taking custody of your assets, because as society breaks down, as the government begins to become more desperate, they're going to start trying to come after your assets. We already hear Joe Biden talking about, you know, proposing the idea in his administration of taxing unrealized gains. So it's going to be very important that you understand how to properly break the UTXO links to your Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, your inputs and outputs. 
and how to be able to convert that those assets into other uh, convert your crypto into other assets. Also, I'm going to be doing a presentation on how I'm preparing for the crash, because as we can see, the yield curve is starting to invert, which is signaling a recession is going to come over the next six to 18 months. Now, uh, with that being said, guys, please type uh, one in the chat and then we can get started. Just want to make sure that you guys can hear me loud and clearly and we can get started. Great. So let's just read a couple of paragraphs. And um, for you trolls out here, because I know I I'm attracting a lot of new trolls because of the Dame Dash video. Um, I don't just sit here and read the news articles. I use the news articles and what's happening currently as a more of a reference in regards to the things that I've been saying was going to happen years ago, just to kind of basically say, yeah, I told you so. If you've been following me, you should be ahead of the curve, not behind the curve. So this slap from the yield curve can't be ignored. Let's zoom in so you guys can see it. An inversion like a smack in the face. For the financial world, it hit with much the same violence as Will Smith's smack to Chris Rock's face. And it's dominated discussion to almost the same extent. The topic in question is the yield curve and its inversion. The spread between the two and 10 year bond yields has long been regarded as a great indicator of an oncoming recession and as a phenomenon that can limit the Federal Reserve's freedom of action. Usually 10 year bonds will command a higher yield for the sensible reason that more risk is involved in investing further into the future and investors require a higher return to compensate for it. Whenever the curve inverts, the two-year bonds yielding more, it's taken as a signal that a recession is coming and that at some point soon, interest rates will have to come down. Now, think about this. We're already at one quarter of 1%, 25 basis points. Go back and watch my video when I talked about quantitative easing a year ago. And I told you that the Fed is going to have to go to negative interest rates, where basically you're going to have to pay to store your money in the bank. This is known as a bail in. I told you that this was coming. There's no way that the Fed can raise interest rates for a prolonged period of time without either affecting the government's borrowing costs or crashing the stock market and crashing the economy. Last Tuesday, there was a momentary inversion for a matter of seconds, which pundits immediately dismissed as meaningless. But Friday, another very strong unemployment report card forced an unambiguous inversion. As I write, the curve is more inverted than at any time since 2007. Now, go back and watch my videos. How, how many times has Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, and Jerome Powell been wrong? They told you inflation is transitory. Don't worry about it. It's only going to happen because, you know, the supply chains are messed up. Well, now we're starting to see, no, inflation actually has been going on since we have delinked ourselves and broken and closed the gold window. It's been happening at a 2 to 3% rate on an average. And that's if you believe the government CPI data, which I don't believe, right? So we know for a fact that they're liars. And again, I say this all the time. Let's ask ourselves a simple question. How is it that I know this? sitting here in my office, yet these people, they've went to Harvard, they've, went, they've gone to schools like Wharton, they've been to the best Ivy League business schools, and yet they continuously get it wrong. Either they're incompetent and they shouldn't have the job, or this is being done by design. All fiat currencies eventually goes back to their original value, which is nothing. And, and the world always resets, the great reset, back to hard money, or in this case, crypto, hard digital money, when we start talking about Bitcoin. Now, when we come here and we look at the, right, again, this is the U.S. Department of Treasury. So this is not me making this up. This is not Photoshop. We can come here and we can look at the two-year. Currently, the two-year is yielding 2.44%, and the 10-year is yielding 2.38%. Why is this significant? Because if we come here and we look at how the yield curve is supposed to look, normally, it's supposed to be upward sloping. What does that mean? That means that the front end should yield a lower interest rate, basically 0.15%.
And as we go up the curve, right, as we go further out the maturity to the 20 and 30 year, you should earn more interest. Why? Because you're locking your money up for a longer period of time. Here, what we're starting to see is we're starting to see an inverted yield curve where it's downward sloping. And we see this with the red line here, where now the front end of the, the actual maturities, they're going to yield more than the long term. Now, why is this problematic? Because now this starts to hurt banks, because the way that the banking system is structured is that they use the Fed funds rate as a rate to borrow short term and lend out the money long term. So remember, number one, banks... When they take your deposits, it's really an IOU, right? Because your deposits is a liability to the bank. So what they do is they lend that money out. So if you have $10 in the bank, they literally can lend out all 10, right? And they can just keep rehypothecating and doing this over and over and over again, creating leverage in the system. But here's the problem. So for example, they will borrow from the Fed at, let's say, a quarter of a percent, give you a credit card at 9%, 22%, a mortgage at 4%. And they make money by doing that. If it gets to the point where it costs them more money to borrow up front, let's say it costs them 4% to borrow up front, well, then it becomes very, very hard for them to make money the way that they're normally making money. And this starts to signal now, because remember, because our economy is so based upon consumption and debt, we start now getting into problems because why? Look at household debt, well over $5 trillion, and it continues to keep going up over and over and over again in regards to total household debt. That was back in 2010. Now we're pushing up towards $14 trillion in total household debt. And it's funny because we're going to get to this article later on. People's houses, right? Their household, the actual value of the house has appreciated more than their wages. So people are earning more in appreciation in their homes than they're actually earning in wages. That's unsustainable, right? Because What's happening now is it's forcing people to speculate on homes, speculate on asset prices, and park their money into real estate, which then what happens? That further creates the gap between the rich and the poor. That further creates this idea of, you know, the racial wealth gap and all these different things, because those that own assets tend to do well in these inflationary booms and these debt cycles than those who don't own assets. Whereas, you know, you get some of the worst debt you get the debt for, you know, the credit card debt, the mortgage debt, you get the car loans, the student loans, and many of you don't hold enough assets to be able to offset these things. So if we come here and we come in, we look at the Fed funds rate, you can see that this is going back to 1955, right? And we can see here, this is where interest rates really peaked at 19% in terms of the Fed funds rate. And look what happened to the Fed funds rate as we look at this. It's actually discontinued to go down lower and lower and lower. This is known as a downtrend where we have these, you know, right? We have these lower highs and lower lows and we have a lower high and we have a lower low. Now, if we come here to 2000, something interesting happens as the Fed starts to raise interest rates. Because remember, when the Fed is cutting rates, the economy, people are taking on more debt. The economy is growing. That's the boom, which is part of the problem. Because we have this debt-based economy and this consumer-based economy. What happens? The Fed blows the dot-com bubble. Because the only way that we can generate these wealth effects is by making people feel rich on paper. So we get this dot-com bubble in the late 1990s. And then what happens? As the Fed starts to raise rates, we get a recession in 2001. And then the Fed starts to raise interest rates in 2005. And then 2006. We start to plateau and guess what happens? Boom. The Great Recession of 2008 happens, right? Because we had a bubble in the stocks. We had a bubble in real estate. Every time the Fed raises rates, market crashes. Then we have this prolonged period of very, very, very low interest rates. Zero percent, zero percent. Let me make this bigger because I think you guys probably can't see it. As we can see here, this is the late 1990s. Again, just repeating this. Fed raises interest rates. We have a crash. We have the real the recession. We have the real estate bubble here in 2005, six, and seven. Then Fed starts raising rates going into that. We have the crash. And then look what happens. For a very, very long period of time, we keep interest rates at near 0%. And then in 2015, 16, you start to see interest rates start to go up. Interest rates start to go up. And then in 2019, we start having the repo market have problems where the Fed had to start injecting 
$2 trillion, $3 trillion, $4 trillion into the repo market. And then the pandemic happens. We don't know what pops these bubbles, but the problem is the bubble in the first place. But as you can see, interest rates, they are trending lower and lower and lower, which is why I'm telling you that you can see here we are right now <laughs> and the Fed raised a quarter of a percent and the yield curve is already inverting. It's already signaling a recession. The boom and bust cycle is starting to happen much more frequently and much quicker, which is a problem. Also, we can look at this right here. This is the, basically the 10-year treasury constant maturity minus the two-year, right? So every time we get below this zero line, this is when we start to have a yield curve inversion. And this is, th these are not charts and data and information that I'm making up. You can go look this up. This is coming from the Federal Reserve. As you can see here, that in, right here in 1998, we had a yield curve inversion. We had another one where we went below. And then you can see we then started going into the recession, right? We had another yield curve inversion here, another yield curve inversion here. Then we had the yield curve start to steepen in. And then we had the Great Recession in 2008. We had the yield curve right here hit the zero line. And then we had the, a brief recession in 2020 after the pandemic. And now here we go again. And we're sitting at the zero line again. History doesn't repeat itself, but it damn sure rhymes. The problem is our monetary policy and our fiscal policy. And this is exactly why I'm a firm believer in there's no way that we're ever going to be able to pay back the debt. Honestly, we're going to have to do it through inflation, right? We're going to have to debase and devalue our currency to do that, which is why the rest of the world is not buying our debt, which is why the Fed is having to go into the marketplace and buy our debt. This ties back into crypto. This ties back into gold, primarily Bitcoin being a store of value because people are looking for assets that they that are hard assets that have a fixed supply that are hard to find that are not easy to create out of thin air, which is why I keep telling you guys, buy you some gold, get you some silver and get you some cryptocurrency. Um, and also, um, Owning real estate would be good because real estate is going, real estate tends to do really well in inflationary environments. Um, so when we do have this crash because of the debt cycle running its course, this is why you have to know how to time the market in regards to when you want to go into cash. You don't have to go 100% into cash because people say all the time, well, what's the solution? Here's the solution. As you're making and building wealth, you want to sometimes sit in some cash and be plotting on what asset classes are overvalued that are due for correction and then knowing when to buy and timing your buys and just understanding where you're going to go. Uh, I also have some other stuff I'll share later on, some solutions. Now, right on cue, you have CNN coming out and saying, don't sweat the inverted yield curve. Again, anytime you hear these people start to talk, do the complete opposite. Because here we go back in... <laughs> Uh, December 2019, they said, should we fear the inverted yield curve? This is coming from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And then we know we had a recession <laughs> uh, a year later. So be very, very mindful of who and what you're listening to, because these people continuously get it wrong time and time again. And if you go watch my old videos, I've been breaking down how, you know, the Fed, when they did TARP and TALF and quantitative easing, and they put all these assets on the balance sheet, and they told you, we're going to reduce the balance sheet once the economy finally gets back to normal. And here we are. They have yet to do so. Um, and then also in regards to inflation, Jerome Powell's been 100 percent wrong for the past, what, you know, five years plus where he's been saying to you, inflation's transitory, inflation's transitory. Now, when you go to the gas pump, you realize it's not transitory. It's here. The price of food has continuously going up. Energy keeps going up time and time again. Now. I really like this chart right here. This is really, really important because as I said to you before, we started at $5 trillion of household debt, right? And if we actually come here and we look at this, this, this counts, you know, student loans, other credit card and auto loans, right? So this is non-housing debt balance, right? But if we look at the total debt, our, the total household debt is approaching $14 trillion. Just think about that for a second. This goes back to what I've been saying to you guys, that the only way the economy can grow is by getting you into debt. That's the only way the economy can grow. The economy does not grow because of 
you know, us producing things. It grows because you go into debt by consuming things. So they have to keep you buying the latest iPhone, buying the latest Gucci, buying the latest Louis Vuitton, buying the latest, the latest computer, keeping you being a consumer and going into debt by doing that. But as I said, think about it. You have a bubble, the boom. It took $5 trillion to grow the bubble. Well, we start to then experience deflation because what happens? As the economy starts to overheat, the Fed starts to raise interest rates, banks stop lending out money. So because banks stop lending out money via credit, or via loans, et cetera, via people getting mortgages, people then start refinancing the house, taking equity out. So people stop consuming. If people stop consuming, business, businesses stop making less revenue. If businesses start making less revenue, and their earnings per share goes down, what do they do? They start cutting employees. Well, if they start laying off employees, then employees are no longer getting paid. If employees are no longer getting paid, they're no longer consuming. Well, 70% of our economy is based off of consuming. So you can see that we're heavily attached to debt because it's like our economy is like a junkie, like a, like, like a heroin addict. And we need more heroin in order for us to, you know, get back to where we are. But you're always chasing that high. So it took $5 trillion to grow the bubble. And then we start to experience deflation. We start to contract $2 trillion. So the Fed or the government through fiscal policy, through stimulus, has to stimulate that $2 trillion to get back to break even and then stimulate more debt in order for us to get more growth. And then we keep getting these boom and bust. But remember, the debt just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So whether it's household debt or whether it's government debt, it keeps growing time and time again. And you can see this chart where we look at the total debt balance is at 14 trillion. But when we look at the non-housing debt balance, we're at what, $4 trillion. And this is student loans, credit cards, and auto loans. Look at this though. You can see that over time, what happens? The debt is just going higher and higher and higher. And I spoke about this earlier, where mortgage rates hit a pandemic high as home prices outpace wage increases making the hot housing markets less affordable because effectively what people are doing is they're treating their homes like a piggy bank, right? People are buying a home. It's appreciating, you know, a hundred percent, I mean, a hundred thousand dollars or $200,000. And then they're basically borrowing or taking the equity out. And what do people do when they take out equity loans? They either fix their home up or they go buy a new car or they put their kid through college or they go on a vacation, right? But they're doing that through debt, <laughs> right? They're not doing that through working, and earning a livable wage. People are doing that through, you know, pushing paper around. And this is what happens where our economy is, like I said before, it's like Ponzi economics, where it's not based upon us actually manufacturing and producing things that the world wants to consume. It's the Fed financially engineering, you know, these debt bubbles, whether it's the dot-com bubble that was created by the Fed, whether it's the real estate bubble that was created by the Fed in our government, or whether it's now the bubble with, you know, these GameStop meme stocks, right? Where you see GameStop and you see Bed Bath & Beyond and Chiba New. Like all, all of these things are, you know, manufactured bubbles because of easy monetary policy and bad fiscal policy. So let's read this article a little bit. It says, as mortgage rates spike to a pandemic high, home prices are rising faster than people can make money to pay for them. According to Freddie Mac. The average U.S. fixed rate for a 30-year mortgage rose to 4.16% this week. That's a far cry from this time last year when borrowers offered rates as low as 3%. Fueled by the Federal Reserve's interest rate hike announced Wednesday, experts predict mortgage rates are likely to continue rising through the end of the year. That's on the heels of a median-priced single-family homes in the U.S. growing less affordable. Homes become more expensive between October became more expensive between October and December of last year in comparison to the same period in 2020, according to proper data provider Adam. Cities surging in popularity have grown particularly less affordable, while markets in larger cities have eased. This is all a part of the Great Reset because guess what? You can't afford a home. What is one of the things I constantly say to you? You will own nothing and you will love it. And this goes back to Jeff Booth's Twitter thread that I always share with you guys, where he talks about, imagine you're playing the game of Monopoly, where the game never resets, and you have to go around the board, and the people who came before you, because they got to purchase these homes at cheaper prices, and then they get to hold these homes and build wealth through inflation, 
Well, people like you and I who are millennials and younger, we didn't get a chance to buy these homes in the 80s when they were great, that, you know, depressed and at low values and then hold them and then pass them down. So the people who sit the closest to the money printer, they tend to do well. But what's happening now is that because we're growing debt at such, you know, a tremendous pace that people's wages, livable wages cannot keep up in order for you to be able to earn the American dream. So now what's happening is you have these huge institutions like BlackRock who are going out and buying up all of the real estate in particular areas and basically making it unaffordable for the average person to live. And you're starting to see homelessness start to spike, you know, and like debt levels start to spike. All of these things are happening and converging at the same time, which is why it is extremely important that you start paying attention to what's going on and taking this serious because your financial health and well-being depends on it. The dollar is in trouble. The world is moving away from the dollar. The world is resetting across the board. As I said earlier, whether it's through climate change, whether it's through monetary policy, whether it's through technology, autonomous vehicles, automation taking your job, jobs, there's so much happening right now that you cannot afford to be distracted by Will Smith, you know, faking, slapping Chris Rock, right? Like you, you can't be distracted by this stuff. Now is the time for you to really, you know, start educating yourself on what's happening in the economy, educating yourself on hard assets, hard money, and what happens whenever empires crash and burn, which is why I'm a huge, huge believer in reading the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. If you do nothing, just read that book. If it takes you a year, two years, read a chapter a month, I don't care. Educate yourself on what's, what's happening because what has happened, because if you can understand what has happened, you will understand what's going to happen. Now, earlier where I talked to you guys and I spoke about GDP, right? The formula to calculate the components of GDP is Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX. That stands for GDP, which is consumption plus investment, government plus net exports, which are imports minus exports. In 2019, U.S. GDP was 70% personal consumption. Our economy is based upon getting you to go out here and buy things. That's it. It's not based upon us producing things. And this is exactly why I'm a firm believer in China and Russia ruling the fourth industrial revolution. Because when you look at the technological advances that's happening there, when you look at the amount of production that's happening there, when you look at the fact that, you know, uh, China has the production, Russia has the energy, um, and they're in the rest of the world, they look at India with the surging population, the fact that we have an aging population, we have so many boomers, you know, retiring every day. And when we look at our national debt at $30 trillion, and then we come here and we look at, you know, the unfunded liabilities at $168 trillion. And as I said earlier, if we look at the, you know, the federal spending, like you got to really like just start to understand that we don't bring in enough revenue in order for us to be able to even pay for, you know, the spending that we're doing, which is why we have to issue government debt, right? And now because the Fed is raising interest rates, as I said before, whenever that starts to happen, that changes the price of money. So now when the yield curve starts to invert, that's going to basically now change the, the, the funding mechanisms and how much it costs to fund day-to-day -day operations, to fund businesses, to borrow money, et cetera. This is why you have to make sure that you are taking your time to educate yourself as to what's going. And this is why I believe, and I stand on what I said, that there's absolutely no way that the Fed can keep interest rates at this level or, or stay on this pace in regards to trying to hike every quarter or do five hikes for the year. Because if they do five interest rate hikes for the year, it's going to crash the economy. And if you crash the economy, you crash the stock market. That's less tax revenue for the government. And then remember that when we come down here and we look at the actual government expenditures, let me refresh this, get this out the way. We come right here. Look at this. Our largest budget items are Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, defense and war, and then interest on debt. If the Fed continues to raise interest rates, then the interest on our debt, what we have to pay on that debt is going to go up. And then now the, we can get to a point where the interest on our debt is one of the government's largest expenditures over Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. So we, we start to see that there's no way 
that we're really going to be able to get out of this. Now, that doesn't mean that this is going to happen over the next year. That doesn't mean that this is going to happen over, you know, the next, uh, you know, the next three years, the next five years. It's going to be time, but we are going to lose our reserve status in regards to the dollar being the world reserve currency. And I did see a donation come in. Oh, uh, let's see something. Let's check the chat, see what you guys are talking about. Michael Davis says, glad to finally be catching you live. Salute to you and the My Tech fam uh, Academy family. Salute to you guys too. Yeah, over. I, I believe that over the next 10 years, you're going to start to see the world more and more start to move away from the dollar. We're already seeing, you know, um, Russia and China start to do that. Saudi Arabia now is uh, contemplating selling its oil for the yuan. Uh, Russia now has deals where they're forcing people to have to buy the ruble in order for them to be able to buy gas from them, natural gas. So all of these things are starting to converge and happen. Uh, and you're going to start to see these, these, this, this de-dollarization happen, you know, over time, which is why, again, you, you have to make sure that you are staying ahead of the curve. If you've been following me, I've been literally telling you guys about this. It was going to happen well over, you know, a year ago, two years ago, where the Fed, is, the Fed's in, a, they're in a tight spot. Like literally, if you look at this chart and you look at the Fed funds rate, literally interest rates have been trending down, right, since 1980. And now we're at the point where we're basically at 0%. We raised a quarter of 1% and the yield curve is already starting to invert. Normally we would have, you know, more time before we start to see the inversion. And th that indicator is about 90% accurate in regards to the 10 year, you know, yielding less than the two year, right? So now you get this downward sloping, you know, a curve, which becomes problematic. Um, Jimmy Andretti says, I'm about to pay off all my debt. That's not necessarily a solution. And thanks for the donation, um, Perry Unlikely and uh, Michael Davis. Um, it's not necessarily a fact that you have to pay off all your debt. And I'm not a financial advisor, uh, so do not take this as financial advice. Um, but I believe that if you understand how to leverage debt in the correct way, you will be fine, right? If you understand that cash is trash, and that you constantly want to be utilizing debt to acquire assets, assets that are, that's going to appreciate with inflation, that's going to give you passive income, um, then you're not necessarily worried about whether or not the, you know, the economy crashes or whether real estate prices crash or not. Because if you know you're, you're putting your money in sound places and you have a well-diversified portfolio, you're not really worried because like Jim Cramer always states, there's a bull market happening somewhere, right? So while the, you know, real estate prices may be coming down or stocks may be coming down, well, then gold's going to be performing well. Then silver's going to be performing well, right? So, you know, um, you know, or crypto is going to be performing well, because I believe that we're going to get to a point where as the world becomes more and more unstable, the rest of the world and especially investors are going to start looking for alternatives to the U.S. dollar and dollar denominated assets. Uh, and this is why I truly believe that the world is going to start looking for, you know, alternatives. We're already seeing it with the truckers in Canada where they had their trucks confiscated and their bank accounts, uh, you know, basically restricted and confiscated as well as their credit accounts. We've seen the same thing happen in Ukraine where now you have Russia invading them and people don't really know what's going to happen with the monetary system there in regards to once Russia finally gains control over the Ukraine. Then you have to think about the fact of, now we impose these sanctions on Russia, but the sanctions really impacts the citizens of Russia, right? Because now certain banks are kicked out of the SWIFT system. Uh, then you have Visa and MasterCard and Apple Pay pulling their services from out of there. So what do you think those people are going to do, right? Because the sanctions are going to negatively impact them. Well, people are now starting to look for alternatives. Crypto is an alternative. And people are looking for alternative systems, which is why I'm a huge believer that we have so much more room for growth in regards to where we currently are. Like if we come here and we look at the overall market cap, we are looking at, you know, a market cap of only $2.1 trillion. 
right? Like, and when we put that into its proper perspective and context, like the stock market globally is worth over a hundred trillion dollars, right? So there's no reason why we can't get to a 10 or $20 trillion market cap over time. And this $2 trillion is every single cryptocurrency combined. Follow me here. And this is very, very important. I want you guys to think about this for a second. When you start looking at where crypto currently is and where crypto currently is at, we don't have, we haven't solved enough problems to bring in the demand that we need. Like most people don't care about finance, right? They just don't. Most people either, they, they, it's just something that they feel is complicated or something that they feel they don't want to deal with. But the NFT concept is the first time that you can actually start bringing in the average everyday person because people play games, they listen to music, uh, beyond the NFT art, right? There's more to NFTs than just art. So as the technology becomes better, right? And it goes through better, like, you know, more iterations and becomes more user friendly. Uh, you're going to get to a point where you're going to start to bring in um, more, uh, you know, more people into the fold as opposed to, and don't worry, my camera just overheated. It's been doing that for a while. Um, you're going to get to a point where you're going to be able to create more demand for crypto. Right now, everyone who wants to be here is currently here. So we have to create more you know, ways of driving revenue and bringing in new users and bringing in new money. And I believe that that's going to happen over time. Like, for example, one thing that sparked, you know, this uptrend that we're currently going through is Luna, which I believe is a Ponzi scheme, but they took their treasury from the Dow and they went out and started buying Bitcoin. And I told you guys before, again, go back and check my track record. You're going to start to see a lot of S&P Fortune 500 companies uh, you know, go out here and start putting Bitcoin on a balance sheet. Well, what starts to happen now when DAOs start putting Bitcoin into their treasury, right? Because we've already mined 19 million Bitcoin. So there's only two, 2 million more Bitcoin left that will be issued over the next 118 years, right? And that's just due to the happening that happens every 210,000 blocks, right? So by 2040, there will be no more Bitcoin issued, right? That's when the Coinbase subsidy and the inflation rate of Bitcoin dissipates and disappears. So Bitcoin is, right now, it's, it's basically correlated with the stock market. But over time, as the world begins to realize that the dollar is risky, that you know being in equities could be risky as well too, especially for in, in particular countries, you're going to start to see people look for assets that trade outside of any particular country. And that's where Bitcoin comes into play. Um, so Jimmy Andronetti says, well, I'm a believer in crypto and thanks for the info. Um, James Matthew says, keep raising the vibration of truth King. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that, you know, and I appreciate all you guys donations. Um, what do you think about living overseas during the recession? Uh, I think that Certain countries are going to thrive. Certain countries are more um, friendly in regards to, you know, their, their tax bases, uh, in regards to how they approach freedom, which is why I'm moving to Miami very, very soon, just in regards to, you know, the tax base um, and also just the lifestyle. Uh, certain governments, and this is why I prefer red states over blue states. Um, I, I'm more, I, I tend to lean more towards like a libertarian conservative in regards to my ideology. Um, but even that's limited as well. But I just think that that's going to be better. Living abroad, there are certain uh, you know countries that you would want to be in. Uh, but you just have to be really, really careful in regards to um, where you're going to go. Also, I'm going to be at the Bitcoin Miami conference that's um, happening this week. Uh, I should be getting into Miami tomorrow. Uh, I'll definitely be down here. Absolutely, S, uh, S rep. I like what he just said. Four million plus Bitcoin is lost in dust on phones. Absolutely. And you have to think about, you know, Satoshi's coins, whether or not Satoshi Nakamoto, you know, is dead or, you know, whether or not he's going to access those coins in his wallet. Right. So a lot of the supply isn't even in circulation, it won't be in circulation anymore. Mm hmm.
a few videos came out of Russia of people living off of crypto. Absolutely. Uh, you're starting to see crypto gain more and more adoption because people are just realizing that uh, governments are becoming more and more unstable as we go forward. And, and the world is starting to become more and more dangerous. And this is just exactly why you have to make sure that you, you know, stay informed as to what's going on. And I, I love to be able to go back here and just look at these videos. And, you know, I saw a troll in here um, stating that I'm a I'm a bullshit uh, economist. Right. And it's just it, it, it's it's funny how someone like myself can just be, you know, I don't get it right all the time. I would say I'm right by probably like about 70 to 80 percent of the time. And, you know, you'll still attract trolls. I've never claimed to be an economist. I've, I've, I just claim to have common sense which is why I named my, my channel What Happened to Common Sense. Being an economist actually is a negative because here you have people like Jerome Powell and you have people like Richard Fisher and um, you, know, you have all of these, Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, all of these Ivy League PhDs. These people went to school for war and they went to business school. They studied economics and finance and they get it wrong all the time. So you're actually complimenting me by calling me a fake ass economist uh, being an economist isn't a badge of honor because most economists get it wrong. Uh, I enjoy the fact that I'm not an economist and I can get it right, uh, which is why I make money and you don't make money. <laughs> right. uh, so we can combat the next recession by holding assets going into it. Absolutely not. Um, the next, think about it. You have to know, for example, so. I'm in crypto. That's where I, I park most of my money at. So, for example, I was in, let's say, uh, where is it at? Solana, right? And I was telling you guys, I don't believe in Solana. I think that Solana is Web 2.0 technology, right? There's nothing really decentralized about it, and there's nothing innovative about Solana. Um, so, I got into Solana, made about an 8x, almost like a 9x. Don't really remember exactly where I got in at, and I sold it. I said, as soon as it flips Ripple, I'm going to sell it. I was on a live stream for my students in the academy. And I said, as soon as it flips Ripple, I'm out. I raised cash, right? So, uh, and I'm also going to be doing a presentation for lifetime members on how I'm going to be preparing for the crash. But you have to know that there's certain assets that are trades, right? Or, you know, that you're holding for a year or two, and then you're looking to raise fiat to then use that fiat to go buy undervalued assets whenever there's panic in a market. So like Ethereum, I'm not selling my ETH. Um, like I, I would never sell my ETH, my polka dot, I would never sell my polka dot. But there's certain assets that I'm in them just to make a quick gain over, and when I say quick, I don't mean day trading, I mean over a year or two. But I know that once this cycle runs its course, I'm going to raise liquidity and raise capital by selling those assets for fiat dollars waiting for the market to crash. Also, you can be looking to short the market by puts in the market. There's other ways of making money. You don't have to just hold assets. And I think that a lot of you, you know, um, you, 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 you get yourself into trouble where you start trying to overanalyze this. If you're a person who, you know, you don't have a lot of time, you know, to, you know, be in and actively looking at the markets, actively looking at your portfolio, you know, looking for new opportunities, then yes, just buy and hold and leave it alone because over the long run, your your crypto assets, your stock assets, and your real estate assets will do well. Um, but if you are a person who understands that we're going to go through a major crash before we didn't have major inflation, which I believe that we're going to have like a massive crash across the board, by being able to sit in cash and raise cash and then buy in at that low end of the market and then ride that inflation up, is going to be wildly, wildly successful for many of you. Um, Kathy, the government cannot control crypto transactions. The government can only control tr crypto transactions that are on centralized exchanges, which is why I tell you guys, you should never be buying crypto well, you can buy crypto on centralized exchanges. Let me correct myself. You should not be holding your crypto on centralized exchanges. And I'm going to be doing a presentation for lifetime members on the 11th, where I'm going to be teaching you guys how you can use, um, you know, uh, mixing services and coin joins to break the inputs and outputs 
that connect your wallet to your transactions and then be able to convert your crypto into other assets without having to go through centralized exchanges. So can the government censor transactions on centralized exchanges? Absolutely. Can they, which is known as a hosted wallet, can they centralize trans, central, uh, can they censor transactions in a self-hosted wallet? No, they can't do that. So that's the difference. Get you a ledger and you'll be fine. Bigger TV says, honestly, sometimes I feel like I'm too behind to learn from you. It's okay. It happens. So here's a simple thing. Simple solution. You don't, you don't need to learn, right? This is what you do. Not financial advice. Buy you gold. Buy silver. Buy crypto. You don't need to learn anything else. If anything you take away from what I'm saying to you, buy silver. Buy gold, buy crypto. Top five cryptocurrencies on my top five. Chainlink, Ethereum, Cosmos, Polkadot, Telcoin. Done. And you could throw an energy web token as well. Not financial advice. Just simply looking at you and just basically saying, that's what I'm doing. Right? You, you, you don't have to overcomplicate this. You don't need a PhD uh, I try to do my best to simplify things, but guess what? Sometimes it just doesn't resonate, and that's okay. Buy hard assets, and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Christy, I, I've heard about them, that they're trying to, um, if you try to send crypto, I, I believe that Canada is doing this that if you try to send crypto over a certain amount that they will make you have to um, KYC who you're sending it to. This is why BISC and you know local Bitcoins are going to be important. Uh, mining your crypto is going to be really, really important. Um, all of these things are going to be important going forward. Uh, but again, what, what will eventually happen is that crypto will start getting adopted and used the way that it's intended on being used. And I think that a lot of you, you, you know, you feel to realize that this is technology that's only going to get better. So we're going to start adding more privacy features into many of these cryptocurrencies as we go forward. That's going to help with the anonymity and help with your privacy as well. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin, they added the taproot up, upgrade. Uh, you have privacy coins like Monero, and it's only going to get better and better. And as we create these more more commerce with crypto and we create these crypto economies. Now you and I are going to be doing commerce and really treating it like currency rather than speculating on a price of these assets. So if I have a self-hosted wallet and you have a self-hosted wallet, well, we don't have to worry about KYC. You really don't have to worry about KYC when you're trying to buy cryptocurrency, right? But if you and I are using cryptocurrency, like it's intended on being used, um, then we don't really have to worry about that. And the Lightning Network is getting better and better. More countries are starting to adopt Bitcoin as, you know, a legal tender. So um, certain governments will be opposed to crypto, but uh, there will be other governments who won't be opposed to crypto. And this is this is just what happens throughout the world, right? Every government's not going to work together uh, to ban crypto. It just doesn't work that way. Um. Uh, in terms of purchasing precious metals, Atmex is a good place. Um, also look at investing into uh, mining stocks like Newmont Mining, um, American Eagle. You will own nothing and you will be happy. The World Economic Forum and Executive Director. Uh, you, you keep saying that in happy ways. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to be entertained in that. Um, let's see what some of the other guys are talking about here. Move this over. Uh, not your keys, not your crypto. Absolutely. <laughs> Look at this. It says Shama, uh, Chamath and his billionaire cronies pumped and dumped Solana. I t listen, guys. I, I made a, I made a bag on Solana. I got in and I got out. I told you guys. Um, same thing with Luna. 
Uh, definitely, uh, you know, looking to start to sell some of my Luna. Uh, just because I believe Luna's a Ponzi scheme. Um, now, the thing with Ponzi schemes in crypto is that they can last longer than you think, like BitConnect, right? It went on much longer than I ever thought it could go on. But, you know, once, whenever you do like a 10x, a 5x on your money, take your money and run. Don't be greedy in crypto. Um, like, I, I see that happen to a lot of people. They hold stuff too long. Um, Nick, I'm going to cover that in the coming days in regards to Elon Musk purchasing uh, Twitter. Uh, I really, truly believe that Elon Musk is purchasing really for, uh, he's trying to get their data and their information. I don't believe that Elon Musk's intentions are pure. Um, you have to be very, very careful with Elon Musk. He, he wants to take on this idea or this, um, this persona of being like a, a Tony Stark and Iron Man. But in reality, Elon Musk is a transhumanist, a transhumanist, and he believes in blending man with machine. He wants to act like he's taking the, uh, you know, other side of technology and he wants to create safe artificial intelligence. And that's not true. Um, he's a part of the elites that wants to, you know, basically uh, trap you in these digital worlds like a matrix uh, and use the technology that they have to live forever. You know, he talked about how you can use synthetic RNA and DNA to be able to, you know, um, reverse aging and things of this nature. So just be mindful of people like Elon Musk, right? They, they, they put, they like to put this persona out there, but Elon Musk is going to be the reason why many of you lose jobs. When he creates the self, you know, self-driving car, perfects it, it's already here, but when he perfects it and then we get the self flying plane, the self, you know, operating train, the self-driving bus, what does that do to you? You know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you guys. I saw this the other day and it just was like, it, you know, it confirmed, you know, so many of the things that I've been saying to you guys. And I plan on doing a video about this too. You know, I always talk to you guys about automation and, and how it's going to take your jobs. Uh, let's pull this up right here for you guys so we can look at this. Um, here we go. Um, I want you guys to look at this factory and I want you to see I want you to look at this factory and I want you to see how many robots and machines are in this factory. Um look at all of these bots in here. And look at them. Like like this is a robot. This is a robot, right, doing this. These are robots doing this. Yes, there are some humans overseeing things, but these are these are jobs that humans would be working. And instead, these are robots and these robots, they don't get tired. They work 24 seven. They don't need a 401k. They don't need health insurance. Uh, you know, they don't need workers comp. They don't need any of the things that you would have to do for them. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, like, look at the, the, this is full of robots and machines. And then you have one person here. <laughs> again more robots you know um so the, the these these are jobs that are being taken away from people um this is what automation does so you know again robots look at this 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 whole facility is basically automated <laughs> right like like you know so um again i i don't i don't say these things to scare you i say these things to inform you um, now, a smart person would be investing in this technology. Uh, you know, a smart person would be looking to, and this is why I follow someone like Kathy Wood, because Kathy Wood's pretty good in regards to, uh, you know, being able to forecast what's to come. Um, you know, so again, don't don't allow people like Elon Musk to fool you, like their intentions are pure, like they're really here to help humanity. You know, he's working on his own androids as well. Um, I believe that he's already using the neural link in his mind and things of that nature. So uh, just be mindful of that, of, of, what, of who and what you're listening to. But we're approaching an hour. I don't like these streams to go over an hour. So we'll get ready to wrap it up like this. Um, I've been telling you guys that a crash was coming towards the end of this year, going into next year. Um, and it looks like I'm probably going to be right. Are probably going to be right. Whenever 
you have a yield curve inversion. That's when the front end of the maturities, the, the twos, is yielding more than the tens. Uh, it signals that a recession is on the way. Um, and notice that this is happening because the Fed is trying to raise interest rates. And I told you guys that it's going to be hard for the Fed to raise interest rates for a prolonged period of time without hurting the government and hurting the economy and then hurting the stock market, which is why I believe that eventually we're going to go to negative interest rates, which is going to be inflationary, which is going to really, that's when we're really going to see crypto and stocks and real estate do well going into about probably 2024, 2025. We are living through the Great Reset and through the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, and who you follow is going to be extremely, extremely, who you follow and what you listen to is going to be important. Um, you can listen to people who are just trying to make a quick buck, or you can take the time to really try to educate yourself with information and join communities with people who are like-minded um, and everyone's trying to grow and thrive together, which is why I created My Tech Academy in the first place. Uh, we currently have a free three-day trial. You're welcome to come and test it out. A link to My Tech Academy is in the description below. On April 11th, I will be doing a presentation for lifetime members only, where I will be teaching you guys how to use coin joins and mixing services to break the links, the inputs and outputs between your wallet and your transactions, and then converting your crypto into alternative assets. I think that that's going to be very, very important um, going forward without having to use centralized exchanges like Coinbase. Um, because again, we're starting to see that they're starting to kind of crack down on um, you know, a lot of these centralized exchanges. Um, and then I also will be doing a presentation in the future teaching you guys um, how I'm preparing for the crash and you know, hedging myself so that I can make money on the way down as well on the way up. Um, so, uh, uh, Earl Edney, when do you think the crypto crash will happen? I think the crash crypto is going to, so you have to understand crypto is going to crash maybe four times, <laughs> you know, before we have the main crash. That's just because it's a, it's a $2 trillion market cap, right? So it's very easy to move the price of crypto around. Like, you know, a lot of you guys get, you, you panic whenever the crypto market drops 30% and it, it's just like, that's crypto, right? It's very easy to move. Crypto could be down 30% today and up 50% next week. Um, like look at Bitcoin. It's up like 40% in the past 30 days. Don't worry about like the, the crashes in crypto because you're going to have a bunch of mini crashes and then, you know, mini booms uh, in crypto. Um, so, but in terms of like the, the real crash that I'm, I'm expecting, like the severe crash, I believe that that's going to happen either at the end of 2022 going into 2023. Like I believe the first quarter of 2023 is when we're going to really get that the first second quarter that 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 just shock that like shakes the market to the core and you know people start panicking like in 2008 or when people thought like the you know the ATMs wouldn't work and the the world was going to end. So I hope that answers your question. And don't worry if you're a lifetime member I'm going to be really really breaking this stuff down to you guys in regards to just you know different you know strategies that I'm going to be deploying to really, really make massive, because like, you can make more money. If you go back and watch the, the Big Short, the movie The Big Short, I encourage you guys to watch it um, and just see how much money that they were able to, Michael Burry was able to make by, you know, shorting the market. Um, you can make so much more money shorting the market than going long the market. It's really just about timing the market. Um, and then thanks for the donation, Brisk Clown. I'm also seeing the self-driving vehicles in the trucking industry, which is why I'm preparing with crypto and other assets. Absolutely. You know, the trucking uh, industry is one of the, um, the better paying jobs for people who are not really college educated uh, and they employ so many people. So again, you have to just be looking at these things for what's to come and not trying to put your head in the sand and be afraid and be scared but just really take the bull by its horns and understand that um, through this shift, through this great reset, there's going to be wealth transfers. And if you're positioning yourself properly, you're going to capture a lot of the wealth uh, if you're just doing things the right way. And again, you know, ignorance is not bliss. What you don't know will damn sure hurt your bank account. With that being said, guys, please like this video, share this video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, set it to all. Uh, a link to join my tech academy is in the description below. 
Also, I'm doing a $5,000 crypto giveaway. Um, make sure that you text the word YouTube to the number below. With that being said, guys, have a blessed and beautiful evening.